please describe your program. My program is based on uh, indigenous knowledge. I, I do circles. Basically, my intention when I do circles or have anything having to do with teaching any kind of or sharing anything having to do with native spirituality, my intention, oh, in the audience, the group I, groups I've mainly worked with are women, children, 12 to 18, and men in conflict with the law, incarcerated in open custody, closed custody, max, secure, and the intention what is to hopefully teach them or show them a little bit about the belief system of the indigenous people, the spiritual belief system, so that they can get in touch with themselves, help them lead to their identity, and the ultimate goal would be healing so that they wouldn't need to do what they need to do to get themselves in conflict with the law. Most people are in conflict with the law or in conflict with themselves and it's usually basic lack of teaching, learning, opportunities for learning about themselves as, as an individual, themselves as an indigenous person, or themselves as a human being with um, purpose and worth. So how we do that is uh, when I worked in Closed custody uh, with the young offenders or young people in conflict with the law was that I would just facilitate circles with them once a week and have a topic like seven grandfather teachings, any kind of stuff like that. I uh, like that meaning, jeez, indigenous spirituality. It's really hard to talk about because when you do it, it's really easy, but when you try and describe it, it's, it's I'm, I don't know. Also just basic teachings like how to smudge, how to hold a feather, what the feather's for, the eagle feather. They used to specifically ask me how to pray. So I try to teach them how to pray. And I try and teach them that you talk to the spirit like you would your friend. Stuff like that. When they didn't have school and I had them every day for five days, I developed a program. Uh, one was called Honoring Your Fire. For the young men, talk about them as their responsibilities as a, as a fire. It wasn't like real, real like men teachings because it's up to men to give those. It was more or less a goal setting. What would you like to do with yourself in your life? Because I found that the young people were didn't have any goals. Like they never thought of the future at all. So I used the poem, the the road not taken got them to draw out maps of their life of where they think they're going to be in 10 years. Anything having to do with self-exploration and self-personal development. So with the men and the women incarcerated, oh, I did the same kind of project with the girls, but talked to them about their, their role as a female and the responsibilities that would go with that and how women are the water. Also, I was involved with helping um, develop a program for the women in conflict with the law for the adult ministry, adult ministry of community safety and correctional services, and we named that program Understanding the Journey, and what the intention there was to help the women understand their life as a journey, again with, with basic teachings of the feather, the medicine wheel, the seven grandfathers, Anything to create some kind of self-awareness and maybe a guide for living. And the purpose of that was for personal development. Hopefully leading a personal fulfillment and not, not necessarily having to be in conflict with the law all the time. That's the intention. A lot of the times I found that they were really interested and learning and some of them are able to find to see their life as dirty rather than living in reaction all the time some of them were ready to hear that stuff some of them weren't they were just coming to listen or at least coming to smudge yeah that was a 10 10 week 10 part lessons it's supposed to be one lesson every week for 10 lessons
understanding the journey. So I'm also trained in the Eastern Door program again for, for Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services and it's to teach basic teachings about Native spirituality and Native spiritual beliefs. So that's what I also do is run sweat lodges. That is really powerful because of the people that come into the lodge when it, where it's dark, it's only them and themselves and the spirit. And when people are incarcerated, their whole life is about protecting themselves. So in there, it's really hard for them to allow themselves to just start to focus on themselves and, and be vulnerable. But after a while, when the spirit takes over, they forget about the other people and they focus on what they need to do. The negative energy that's holding them back, that needs to leave some unresolved issues with grief or past mistakes. They get to release that energy in the sweat lodge and that leaves them open for to have a peace, bit of peace of mind for a while, personal peace. And it also, I believe, helps them to clear the way for the lessons that were learned from their life experiences because they're not working so hard to survive what they're feeling. They're, they have a little bit of a break to take a breath and, and create some thoughts. So again, it's personal development leading to empowerment. And that's what I, that my wish for all Indigenous people, especially Indigenous, well, for every hu human being, but especially for Indigenous people who have been manipulated into giving their power and believing that the government has to and needs to look after them. My belief is that us as Anishinaabe people, we are capable, more than capable, of looking after themselves, ourselves, and own our power and not give it to any outside entities. But to get that across to people is really hard, especially when victim-dependent thinking has been promoted, nurtured. And one thing I found with survivors of abuse is that once the abuse stops, human beings have a tendency to take over being abused themselves or looking for something or someone to abuse them because that's the energy that they're used to carrying and used to having. And as Anishinaabe people, uh, we were gifted with a way to get rid of that energy so we can empower ourselves. But it would be nice that all Anishinaabe believe that right. <laughs> <laughs> or do that or we're aware of it rather than living in reaction, but living in, or in a, from a place of defensiveness of never feeling or never being good enough to a place of yes, I can do this, and and it's okay to do this. Mm. Something successful. What other program? Ask the question again. Did I yeah, answer sure. it? Oh, you no, know, for sure, yeah. You okay. talked about, yeah. Is there a way, a way to measure success? Oh, <laughs> I've been asked that before. <laughs> I'm going well with the people that we work with. Uh -huh. uh, Number the measure of success is number one. They're still alive, okay. Because they live a really, really self-destructive lifestyle with drugs and violence and being hookers, prostitution. That's what I was looking for. A really, really unsafe, on the edge lifestyle, homelessness. So the measure of success is the the basic measure is that they're alive. As we go up the scale, anyone who's clean and sober is a measure of success. Anyone who has stopped being in conflict with the law or at least had less charges. And the ultimate measure is if someone is clean, sober, working, has their family, and is what society would deem functional or successful. So... It's a large scale with the with the programs that I'm involved in of what success is. Nice. There's oh sorry. No, that's fine. No, and it's it's definitely sometimes it is difficult to measure success, right? Like in in another in another place where I got to work in the past, you're paying for memberships at say the Y for instance. Right? It's kind of hard to track someone's success. Say they're 
taking swimming lessons, right? You, you don't know over the long term how successful they were, other than well, they're still alive. They have they didn't drown, drown. <laughs> <laughs> right? And that's that's like a longitudinal <laughs> yep. kind of measure. Yep. You know, it's kind of hard to track these things. So I, I definitely know, you know, where some of that comes from that you were talking about for sure, yeah. for sure. Yep. Okay. Um, so that, so that, that, like all these things lead into the next, the next kind of area of questioning. And that is from, from your perspective, what is indigenous education? My, um, my just, perspective or the perspective? Yeah, from your perspective. Uh, something that kind of popped into my mind as you were sharing earlier was you seem to flow between kind of indigenous and Anishinaabek kind of words to capture, I guess, where you're coming from. So how, 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 does, how does that feed into indigenous education too, I guess? Like, is it, are you purposely using indigenous yeah, to uncover everyone because who you get to deal with, or do you primarily deal with Anishinaabek people? I guess is a question. I um, primarily deal with Anishinaabek people. Okay. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Those are just oh, I have a hard time with that because of the labels that the government keeps changing. So I'm trying to train my mind because <laughs> I keep getting corrected at work. You have to say indigenous now. I'm like that's so dumb. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the kind of truth we're looking for, for sure. So I, I don't oh, think okay. you should feel sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, uh, uh, the government is, is, those are foreign words to us. Mm. And I'm not a fluent speaker, and I wish I was, but I, I didn't take the time to actually learn or pay attention. But to me, those are all just labels. So when people ask me, do you prefer to be called native or indigenous or aboriginal? I'm like, I really don't care because those are all foreign words. They're just labels. Mm -hmm. They're not even real. Like, they could change again. So that's when I use Anishinaabek. To me, that's, uh, we're Anishinaabe. Like, uh, my tribe is a uh, group of people where I come from is Temiagama Anishinaabe. That's who we are. And our land is Dakimanan. That's around Lake Tomogamy, that's who we are. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that that's why I fly back and forth. Right. Yeah. Okay. So maybe what we need to talk about is what is Anishinaabek education okay. to you then? To me? Yeah. Anishinaabek education to me is what we learn from the time we're child. This is just to me, and I'm feeling guilty saying that because there are so many people who didn't grow up in their on their land. They didn't grow up in their regular, their original home where their ancestors are from. So I, I, I guess I should acknowledge the fact that I was extremely fortunate to grow up on Dakimanon with uh, parents who used the land to, worked with the land to keep us fed and alive. Uh, my dad was a trapper and my mom helped him uh, with the animals and everything that needed to be done to create a good life, to make sure that there was food, clothes, traveling. And to me, what I learned from the bush is true indigenous education because there, everything was there on the land that we needed for life. And that is where we learned our survival skills. That's where we learned who we are and what we could do in our connection and I believe that we're very fortunate for that as well because we know that anywhere on this world wherever we are we have a home and it doesn't I don't mean a, a structure with a roof over it I mean like a home uh, when I think of home I don't think of the house I think of the water and the land and to me that's what indigenous education gives us to help us feel grounded, to know who we are, to be connected, not just to the spirit, to the creator, to the earth, but to, to each other, to our family, to our community, and the animals, and everything. That, that's, we're part of that. And it's really important for 
a young person to feel part of something, to know they belong somewhere. So I think of that a lot about uh, the things I know today or my survival skills navigating in town or working with the government to deliver Native spiritual practices to help people learn that. I, I know I learned that a lot growing up on the reserve and uh, being taken into the bush. So Indigenous, Aboriginal, Anishinaabek education to me is experiential learning. We where we experience something and, and we learn. Uh, we experience it and then our teachings come, our lessons come from what we're experiencing. So as a uh, native person who went to school, and I guess that's why it worked, I got a diploma in office assistant administration, and the only reason I took that program was because I didn't know how to run a computer. <laughs> and I knew I needed uh, to run a computer if I was going to try and work. So I went to the Academy of Learning, and that they don't have that anymore, but you listen to, you read the book, then you listen to a tape, and then you do the lesson with the tape guiding you, and then uh, you do the lesson on your own. And at the end of so many lessons, you write an exam. And that was experiential learning, but they're, they're also infiltrating all your senses, mm. like the listening and the reading, so it goes implanted into your brain, and using your own volition to, mm. to type everything out that they just showed you. And that that's what worked for me. It worked really well, was experiential learning and applying that knowledge. My ears perked up. There was a moment where my ears were like, oh, that's really interesting that, that she would say that. You had said we are a part of that. And I, th I think you were talking about our connection to the land. Yeah. Right? You were saying how important things were. And you had just said, like, we are, we are a part of that, you know, a part of that. Uh, part of the land like are there other are there other things that are a part of whatever that is to you besides the land the land the water the sky the earth the animals everything mm -hmm. the spirit spirits that live there mm -hmm. spirits inside of all of those things that I just and the creator yeah and there's there's lots of layers there for sure right Something like there's there's like a part two. This is like question number two, really, and part B kind of speaks to the information we want to make sure gets passed on to the future. You know what I mean? Something that's been talked about before was it seems like the, there's a, there's always common stories that are shared in different circles where we go. Say there's an activity at such and such a health center or that kind of stuff. Um, they kind of talk around the same kind of stories. But are there stories that you've heard of from your family or friends or, or that sort of thing that aren't really getting out there anymore, but you feel they're so important that we should make sure that they're captured somehow or, you know, that we, we include that in what we're sharing these days. I can't think of anything. They're like the legends are on the lake. Mm -hmm. It's the non-natives that are writing them down. Mm -hmm. And the ones, they, they are really... And that's the I lake where you're from? Is yeah. Is that what we're talking about? Okay. Yeah. Lake Tuongami. Uh, they wrote them down. And there's information there that I didn't even know about. I'll go into detail. Example, Devil's Mountain behind Camp Kewaden, any time we drove up the lake, I could feel that mountain or energy coming from it. And I'd be like, I'd ask my dad, can you feel that? And he's like, yeah. And I asked him about it, and he says, well, there was a big fight here uh, between the devil and another spirit. And he says, but I don't know the whole details anymore. And I'm like, oh. And then later on, about a week or so later, he messaged me and says, so and so wrote it on the on this website, and it talks about the legend. He wrote it down, 
And I don't even know if that's the true legend because when things are repeated, they're uh, changed. Mm. It's like instead of the, instead of saying in, they'll say out. Like the, and change the essence of the story. Okay. Yeah. But the basic story is that's where I learned it, and then there's after I read that, there were still more questions I had. Why am I feeling so much from that mountain? And is it good or is it bad? Uh, negative or positive so as I'm sitting here talking maybe I should better go sit on the mountain and ask it (laughs) 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 Uh, the stories I found that were most helpful to me and I try and pass it to my children and in a good way sometimes it's not always good but which family a person comes from and where was their domicile which part of Dakimanon that they live on because mm. everybody had their own family territory then people grow up they get married they move away and then all of a sudden somebody pops up you don't know who they are and oh that's so and so's grandchild like that's that's the common theme there my mom was really good at that my dad's okay at it but I noticed my my aunt my mom's sister is just no interest like, she doesn't even see the importance of saying who these people are because she she known them all her life and just took it for granted that she just knows who they are. But to me, it was, I think it's important to know those things. And the reason for that is I remember this young man, we went, Lorne and I went to a, a conference, a residential school conference uh, put on by James Bay Mental Health in Cochrane. And there was a young man there going, oh, I'm looking for my relatives because he researches his history. And then he says, my great aunt was Beatrice Chum. And I'm like, whoa. And then she married a pot. And I'm like, yeah, that's my family. We're cousins. So I have a Creek cousin that I... So uh, just stuff like that. And it's exciting like to know like our... And the survival of, of us as Anishinaabe... Uh, when we're not supposed to be here like mm-hmm. that's exciting and uh, for me the young people um, don't see the importance of that when they were young just like I didn't see the importance of really paying attention to my mom and her her siblings or and my grandma when they were speaking Ojibwe with each other mm-hmm. it was just something they did and not knowing as I got older how neat that was like I thought it was neat when I was young but it was like oh yeah they're yapping away again but when I got older, I'm like, holy Moses. So I, I, I bore my children to tears sometimes with who's related to who. and But I'm hoping when they get older, they can connect to that and see why I thought that was important. Yeah, just to piggyback on the idea of why that was important. When I initially talked to you about being a part of this project as an interviewee, I had shared with you that it was about education and the importance of it. And I don't know if you remember or not, but you you had you had gone into this this sharing where you had talked about how important education was from your grandma your grandmother's perspective, I think. And you had you had said that she did a very good job on instilling something in you as a person about that. Uh, if you remember this, um this would be a, a good place to kind of oh. <laughs> bring that up again because okay. when when you had, when you were sharing this, I was like, oh, I wish we were interviewing right now because you know is a is a good kind of it kind of captures a lot of what was happening with this project. I think. Okay. Oh, Grandma Potts's influence was huge because she she really was a strong woman who worked all the time. There's no room for laziness, and you got to go to school so that you get an education so you can work and survive in society. She never said it like that. (laughs) 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 But achieving something was really important to her, and she basically led by example. Like, where she was young, she had her family. When she got older, she realized she needed to support herself, so she went back to school in her late 40s and became what they call an R- uh, RPN. So she worked at the hospital as a nurse's assistant uh, for years, and that example she gave really 
made the trail for her children, who are all really hard workers and educators. I have two uncles that were our teachers and principals and education directors. One's retired now. And there was just no sitting around in, in the Potts family. You were always using your gifts and your brain for something. And that led the example for me and all my cousins because we're all, we've all gone to school, we've all worked, and we teach that to our children, the importance of finishing a course, doing a course, uh, getting some skills. And when I sit down and think of my own experience with education and the different places I've been in school, I, I love going to school, I love learning, I love talking with people, researching, and I find that it really helped with personal development because sometimes, like, I talk to a lot of people now, uh, a lot of them can barely read and write, like prisoners, and there's so much that they're not aware of in the universe, in the world, even concepts of thinking patterns when you study English or find out the history of things. I guess what Grandma taught us was that meet the challenge, mm -hmm. embrace the challenge, and get through it. And there's no reason not to. So part of this question talks about uh, what stories and or teachings would you like your grandchildren and great-grandchildren to be able to hear you talk about? It sounds like like finding out the history of things is important to you. Yep. Um, are there stories or teachings that, that capture that uh, specifically that you would want to make sure get passed on to the few next generations? Or just generally are there stories and teachings that come to mind that you would want to make sure get passed on? I think the stories and teachings of their parents, grandparents, great the, the ancestors' journey on how they lived and, and what they did in their life because it, there's a lot of life lessons in those the things that I know because like my grandma's story is really powerful even my grandma my grandma Mattias on my mom's side my maternal grandmother her story with all her kids and, and the life she experienced just being on the reserve was on Lake Tomogamy, not the reserve, but was there's a lot of life lessons in there and a lot of relationship lessons, say, among the families and where they got their values from, volition, and the differences. And I, I don't know if it's because I'm a female that I'm looking more at relationship stories, life experience stories of individuals. Those are important. Like even listening to Lorne and the stories he has of his grandfather, to me, was like the epitome of an empowered person. Where he wasn't intimidated by government. Where he was, he could make things by himself. Always working and looking after himself. Building his own house. Things like that. I think the theme that we grew up with, that we learned from my grandmother, is independence. Uh, you need to be independent. My own mother taught me that as well. Well, my whole family, like, an example is if we couldn't, these are the stories I'd like to pass on, that if we couldn't get the skidoo started, we couldn't go for a ride. And if it broke, we needed to at least have an idea how to fix it, like mm -hmm. if the spark plugs were gone or just little things like that, because we all know how to do that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Stories of how people learn to survive. Like my dad, when he talks about his, when he first tried to live on his own and him and his brother were really hungry. Because that's how they realized, oh yeah, I have to work to get some money and oh yeah, I actually have to cook. <laughs> <laughs> How, all the things your parents do for you. <laughs> right. It's just funny, like, but it's true, like that's really traumatizing for a young person. <laughs> and stuff like that, it's, it's just stories of regular life I guess sure yeah yeah and big stories I really I really don't know like I don't have any like one true story just a bunch of life stories right right okay yeah what's what's a good Paula Potts story 
oh. that you'd, you'd be willing to share with us. You said you have Paula Pop stories. So if, is there a favorite a favorite moment in your life that you would like to make sure that... Well, I had a nap today, and mm-hmm. I was dreaming about my old school I went to, my high school. And I tell that story a lot. Not, well, my experience there. And so when I was 16, I was starting to get lost, starting to get into the teenage party scene, and my marks dropped. And my dad looked at my marks and said, you're going to boarding school, girls' private school. Because back then they weren't that expensive, and what my community did was take all that money they got from Indian Affairs for the tuition and the board and all of that, room Mm -hmm. and board. They lumped it all together and gave it to the private school, and then the parents paid the rest of the tuition. So we were all, we were in the time, generation, my generation, uh, kids born around 1970 where our parents were number one in a position to pay to top up because they all worked Mm -hmm. and number two there was enough money in the government uh, funding for education where we got to go to these private schools Mm -hmm. so like I said I I told a story about they didn't offer general courses it was all advanced university courses so and we lived at the school and this was a really good development experience for me because I met girls from all over the world. China, Mexico, Dominican Republic. Um, one girl was from Japan and then other girls whose parents worked for the Canadian government and were stationed in different countries like Saudi Arabia and India. Oh, I met girls from India too. And I met a family... Two girls all of a sudden showed up. They're from Liberia. They had to run away from the revolution. Stuff like that. So it was really interesting. The first year I was there, there was only one other native girl. And she wouldn't tell anybody she was native. Because, again, we're mixed blood. We don't look like full natives. Everybody thought I was half Japanese in that school. And she wouldn't admit she was native. That was my first time running into that. Like, oh, wow. I've never run into that in my life. Uh, We were also raised to be very proud of who we are. I was also raised to see everybody the same. Like to not differentiate between the races. Mm. So I guess being at that school was really easy for me because I saw an individual. I didn't see, oh, there's a Chinese person or there's a Japanese person, stuff like that. I didn't, or there's a black person. I didn't, I wasn't raised like that, so... Mm. But she wouldn't admit she was Native and she got mad at me when I told her roommate she was Native and I'm like, Jeez, like, what's wrong with you? And I had no shame. Like, I didn't under... I did not connect to the shame that Native people had. Again, because I probably didn't run into the same kind of racism and insanity that other people did. And if we did run into it, again, the kids my age... I don't know how we were socialized, but we were... We'd laugh at the person if they ran us down because they were native. We were native, and they're like, "What's wrong with you? Like, we're we're great." <laughs> and we didn't even see ourselves as native. We just right. saw ourselves as children, as people, mm-hmm. human beings, and we're just here, like, to have a good time. Like, just that's how kids think, you know. We're, it's mm-hmm. gonna be fun. So, at the school, the second year, so I went through grade twelve, got all my credits. It was really, really hard because. Southern Ontario was in Whitby, right outside Toronto, is so different than Northern Ontario. And I that was the worst time I had in my life, being away from home, being away from anything or anybody familiar. The traffic, the people were rude, nobody talks to you, nobody looks at you. Like in Northern Ontario, it's like, hey, how are you doing? So different. So the second thing that really... I wasn't going to go back in grade 12 at Christmas time. My parents said, oh, if you're having that hard of a time, because I used to cry every day in the bathroom, because <laughs> mm. <laughs> I was so lonely, and I, I wasn't going to let any of these other girls see me cry. So I had a lot of pride, too. So, uh, But I remember we went to visit my great aunt, my, gra- my gra- grandpa Potts, his sister, up in Notre Dame de Nord, that's shooted on the reserve there and my mom was good friends with her so we go visit with her and I'm standing in their kitchen like wondering I don't know what to do do I go back to school or do I come back home I really don't know what to do because I'm really like 
having a hard time down there. Not academically, but socially. And then my, my aunt's sitting there, and she's puttering around at the kitchen table. And, and this is how she said it. She goes, you got enough pots backbone. You stay there. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Decision was made. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So I went back to school, and then uh, things got better. And I finished the year. And I only needed two credits to graduate high school, but I thought I'm really not ready to do anything else. And it was kind of like easy, like coast. Mm. And I didn't have to take math again. So I uh, I went back for grade 13, back to the same girls' private school. And all the mean girls were gone. They had graduated. So I remember walking in that day, the first day when you first go back to school, and I said, I'm going to make this a really good year. So that's when I clued in that we decide what kind of life or day or experience we're going to have and by this time because I was raised by a politician as well I knew the importance of influence of people I didn't know it at the time but later on the teachers told me that I was the only one who would go into like the one from Canada who would go into the Chinese girls rooms and visit with them because I, cause they were, I was fascinated with their country and the things, their culture, and things they were willing to share with me. And I just thought everybody did that. The Mexican girls, I like them because they were done high school. Uh, but And they came up here. They were the wealthy ones. They came up here to learn English. So what better way to learn English than being immersed in it? So they like to party. <laughs> <laughs> And they, I, those are the ones I really like. Got along with because they were lots of fun. So, I did. I I decided that I I wanted to be senior class president because all my friends had positions. They were in the school where they were prefects, but they were there longer than me. So, I said, okay, I need a position. So I decided I was going to be senior class president. So when it came time for voting, I just told uh, asked my Mexican friends to tell all their friends to vote for me. So you could hear them in Spanish. And then my Chinese buddies, I'm like, hey, tell tell them to vote for me. So again, you see, I hear them yapping in Chinese, and then yeah. sure enough, landslide, like, because there are so many of them. That's how I got to be the senior class president. And then uh, from the senior class president, we at senior dinner at the end of the year, we had to give me and the other senior class president, she was from the Bahamas, we had to give the final speech. We had to give a speech. And the education that I had on the reserve was that we had really proactive teachers who who saw that uh, because we lived in an isolated community that we needed to be socialized in the big world, that's what we call it. So they put us in public speaking contests. They put us in drama festivals. And they took us on school trips for like two weeks at a time, like down south where we just camped at all these places. So we had really awesome proactive teachers like that who kind of knew that we needed to do this and we, they had really high expectations of us academically as well. I remember if a kid, if they saw, because it was so small, like uh, if a kid went swimming and left his books by the, at the boathouse on the dock, I remember the teacher just, just really talking to that kid about responsibility and how valuable those textbooks are, mm -hmm. things like that we were always taught on a school on the reserve. So at this school, when I was graduating high school, because I did a good job with my senior class speech, uh, the teachers need to nominate you for valedictorian. So I got nominated to be valedictorian. And again, I'm telling the Chinese girls and the Mexican girls and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and asking everybody to vote for me. Again, it was a landslide. I was a valedictorian of my graduating class. And the funny thing is, it was when you think about the native part, number one, they thought I was joking that my dad was an Indian chief because they have no clue about native culture at all. Before internet. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't know anything about natives. So I remember one time, because I was senior class president, I had to go to all the seniors' rooms. And there was one room, because it was an old school, it was an old castle, so I call it Trafalgar Castle. There's one room that was kind of haunted, I guess, or there was something in there. And the their three Chinese girls were in that room when I was in grade 13. In grade 12, one of my friends was in that room, and she was kind of an empath. And she'd tell me about all these weird noises from the closet, and she'd have to wear, like, earphones, uh, earplugs to sleep. And 
So it was really funny because I went to that one girl's classroom. I mean, bedroom, those three girls. My friend had moved on. And it was three Chinese girls in that. And they opened the door. And I could feel something coming from that closet. And I'm like, oh, it's still here. Right. <laughs> and I didn't even realize I said it out loud. And I swear to God, those Chinese girls grabbed me. Literally grabbed me and hauled me into their room and said, you know something? And they're going on and on about what was going on in this closet. And it was like there's an entity in there. Da, 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 da. And they're just like, yeah, this has been going on all year. But we didn't want to tell any of the real Canadians, but we knew you would. Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't really know what a native person was. Right. But they had an idea that I wasn't like the other Canadians. Like uh, they picked up on that that I must have grew up in a different culture, and because I didn't even realize I was in a different culture till university, but no, till like my, till I was almost thirty years old, that we had a different world view and that we had our own culture, not right. just like a physical, or reserve life, but that we have a different world view. And I had no clue about that because well. It wasn't on. I didn't even care. In grade thirteen, I was nineteen. It was like I was finishing high school and planning to go to university, and I was still having a good time. So, I always tell that story about how those Chinese girls from Hong Kong were didn't consider me a real Canadian, <laughs> and I took that as such a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so. That so my my experience at 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 high school and going to the girls' private school, there's a lot of things I learned. It was like because it was like a micro community. Mm. It operated like a community. There was good things, negative things. Always someone in trouble. Always someone complaining. Like all the things you see in a community, and everything was crappy. And then you know, and then you realize after it's like it was really good. And just the different, my exposure to the different ways people thought. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciated that. Uh, just simple things. Like my room, <laughs> I had a roommate from Trinidad and she was very, very spoiled. And she had a really physical mindset where you're defined by your money and your property and your position. So one time she comes, she used to, she was so dramatic. She come flying in the room crying. And she, she's like, nobody's talking to me. And I looked at her and of course I'm like really like, I'm 19. I haven't lived at home for high school since I was 14. And I'm just like, you know, you're there for school and just look after your business. And... So I was really, I, was, I, was, I wasn't really nice to her. I wasn't mean either, but I was just really honest. And I told her, I turned and I told her I'm watching her cry. That's why I used to just sit there and watch her cry for a while. And I tell her, you know, you know, you made a big mistake. And she goes, what? I said, you talked about your money and your family's position in Trinidad. I said, the girls don't go for that here because they don't care. I said, everybody here has some kind of high profile parent. And most of the girls here have lots of money. So that they don't care. Mm. And you, you look, made yourself look stupid. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, oh. The other time, I always tell stories about my roommate too. She was, I must have learned a lot from her. Another time when the report cards came out, uh, again, this was a really big thing to her. The door come flying open. Like, this is a really old building, so the doors were big and wooden and wide. Oh, right. So the door fly open, and she literally, like, took two steps and flew across the room and landed on her bed crying with her head down and just wailing. And I'm going, what's wrong? I'm all calm sitting at my desk or whatever. Most likely she woke me up, and I'm like, she's like, uh, I'm like, what's wrong? And she goes, oh, my report card, and I have such low marks. And she's freaking out about it, and... I wish I was Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, I had no idea what to say that. I'm like, well, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I said, and the pressure on those girls oh. for, for academic achievement, like we can't even fathom that. So, And 
they're they're naturally smart. Like they've grown up. That's all they did was their work. There was nothing else. I think to have to expect to have the same marks as the Chinese was is really far reaching. <laughs> <laughs> In that school, because it, again, it's a different country, right, with different uh, values. Yeah. So. So the, I, I graduated high school from there. That was a big deal because it didn't even, didn't even look like I was going to graduate. I remember when I was 16, I was like, I'm going to run away. Like I was just like the classic little teenager full of herself. And yeah, I can work a minimum wage job and make it. Like I was, you know, so out of touch with reality because you're spoiled and you're 16 and whatever. Like you take everything for granted. You have no clue how much it work everything takes. So, anyway, I didn't run away, and I knew if I did, my dad would find me, because he knew all these people all over Canada from uh, working for Assembly First Nations and Chiefs of Ontario, stuff like that. Yeah. So, but that that was my story of my high school, and that was really good for me and my personal development, and that I, I did it, and I stayed there. I had lots of fun, lots of hard times, lots of fun. And I, I can, I still have a lot, some of those girls on my Facebook page, which is uh, cool. All right, yeah. You know, some of the girls I stayed friends with and just keep up with. And now, just recently, like I know I told my roommate about money and nobody cares about it, but there's one picture I have of my friend from Liberia. And she has pictures of her son's birthday. And he's got like an Audi SUV. For his birthday, and he's uh, 17. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, Lapu must be loaded, and I didn't know. <laughs> I just like hanging out with her because she was just such a sweet, awesome person. Right, right. <laughs> I only clue into that now. <laughs> she, yeah, her family must have been loaded. <sighs> That's great. Yeah. Some great sharing happening. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, we had a talk about indigenous education, uh, things you wanted to make sure the grandchildren kind of learned about. Don't give up. That's my family theme. Ah, there we go. Never give up. Don't give up. That's, yeah. that's repeated over and over. Oh, okay, yeah. Family motto. Yeah. What is your vision for indigenous or Anishinaabek education? over the next 10 years? My education or education for Native people? Yes. Ah. All of that. <laughs> There's no wrong answer here. <laughs> yeah, well, I would like to go to university and finish it, because I never did. Uh, but that's later on when all the bills are paid and the kids are looking after themselves the way they're supposed to. And the only reason I want that is, is to say that I, to finish something that I'd started, because I only went one year. And then uh, I think that would really be really good for my self-esteem, mm. personal development. Because the jobs I get now, I beat out the university applicant. <laughs> 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 so it's not about getting a job or anything, it's about me, my personal mm. volition, belief, whatever. Yeah. Okay. It would be for me. As for Anishinaabeg people, it would be nice if everybody went to school, got some kind of skilled skills, even if it doesn't have, it could be anything, but something that will add to their personal development to increase the self-esteem and to know their power. Because there's a lot of personal development that comes from doing anything, mm. experiencing anything. And I, there's a lot of people who have self-esteem issues. I, I wouldn't say that Anishinaabek are necessarily lazy. It's self-esteem, like the belief that they can do it. And that they'd want to do it just, just to feel good. Hmm. About their life and themselves. Okay. I'll, I'll uh, step back into... I want to hear from Paula Potts. Understanding your journey, educator. Are there parts of that that need further enhancement in the next ten years? Are there are there different ways to go in there? 
to reach some kind of goal that you might have that you're striving for currently or are you pretty happy where where that is right now in terms of the education of participants oh, i'm thinking of young people now educating mm. young people yeah to educate young people i am um, i uh when you put it in perspective, understanding the journey, it would be really neat if they could, when they're young, 10, 11, 12 years old, if they're open for it, 9, maybe even younger, but how, and the open-mindedness of parents to allow their children to attend the ceremony, to find out their spirit identity, and, and to, to go into these ceremonies so that they'll be grounded. And it's not necessarily to... Because the way Native spirituality is now, there's a lot of like dogma and rules that are infiltrated, have infiltrated our teachings, and it kind of like dehumanizes and despiritualizes the people. Mm -hmm. My idea of, under, of this is to connect people to their own spirit and to, to the Creator, the Great Spirit, and that they can be grounded and know who they are and know that there's something to rely on mm -hmm. that they necessarily can't see but it, I think that's what being part of the land too uh, but it gives you a knowing and a feeling that you're not alone you have support even though you can't necessarily see it and it's not something a human being can give you but if you've connected yourself to that essence I guess that makes you feel stronger and supported, less vulnerable. And that would be a nice vision for these children to get. Anybody, actually. And it makes you feel strong on the inside. Um, are, are those the same kind of goals or objectives that would be transferable to the Eastern Door or to honoring your fire or would there be different kind of nope that is the goal same thing that is across the, the board yeah just okay. for something for them to grab onto because only dealing with the physical is really difficult and there's so much conditions on on being a human being if you look at life just physically you got to be this you got to be that you got to look over a certain way act a certain way be a certain way and if a person can uh, connect to themselves and to the spirit, then they start to understand themselves as a human being and that there's no conditions on that. You just exist and it's okay and preferably to uh, love yourself so you don't go on a path of self-destruction. Because mm. that's how they end up where they're at. You know, they've been raised and born to people who don't like themselves and are self-destructive and they didn't take the time to teach their kids.